focus on marriage. Michelle and Mark want to get married before God, but the church won't let them. Anne and Wendy want to get married, but can't. Debbie and Paul got married and lost out. Tonight, World in Action examines marriage 1995. If we'd have known then what we know now, we'd have left it, we wouldn't have got married. Nineteen ninety-five has been a bad year for marriage. Instead of saying, I will, a growing number of couples are saying, I won't. Celebrity breakups continue to hit the headlines, while more and more ordinary couples now think twice about taking the plunge. In the last two years, divorce figures hit a record high. Meanwhile, the total number of weddings is the lowest since the war. More children are born out of wedlock than ever before. We must not undermine families. I believe in the family. Taking responsibility for yourself and your family. Behind strong communities lie strong families. And we should certainly not encourage people to choose to have children without a commitment to bring them up together. The government is so worried they've set up a committee to look at ways of strengthening the institution of marriage. Tonight, World in Action asks, are a new generation turning their back on traditional family values? Are loving couples agreeing to have and to hold off? We met in Leeds at a party and um, through some mutual friends, didn't we? Yeah, I'd moved there for, um, for a job as I was a student in Leeds. Yeah. Um, I'd actually, I was already going out with someone. So when we met, we couldn't sort of start going out straight away. And um, it was only sort of six or seven months later that we actually got together. We both sort of had our separate accommodation and um, we, we continued having that until we sort of moved to Manchester. I think that was it then, isn't it? Once you, you know, move in with someone, you just, yeah. you, there's a commitment straight away there. Sam and Matthew have lived together for five years. They're part of a new generation increasingly turning its back on the institution of marriage. They've also contributed to the growing trend, unmarried couples having children. And we talked about our fears and anxieties and, you know, do you, do you want to have a baby? And it was just like a natural progression. It wasn't, marriage didn't even come into it really. You know, it was just sort of, um, it, this is important and in our relationship and let's, let's talk about it. And that's what we've done every time anything's come up. And I can't see how it would affect Jack, not in the society that we live in now. I can't see how it would affect him if we weren't married. There isn't the stigma of sort of being an illegitimate child and born, born out of wedlock. I think it's like things like the vows. Um, you know, you must honour and obey a man and being given away by your dad. I mean, I know you don't have to do these things, but it's so ingrained, that contract element. I mean, that's totally against everything I believe anyway. I mean, if, if you're talking about an equal relationship, certainly wouldn't do that. And I, and I know some people get married and, and cut that out. But to me, it's still inherent in the, in the whole tradition. Going to the chapel and we're gonna get married. The 60s have gone down in history as the era of free love. But in fact, marriage was at an all-time high, thanks to a booming economy. At the time, only one in 20 couples cohabited. As young people started to earn more money, they could afford to marry younger. At the start of the 70s, the average bridegroom was 22. His bride was just 20. Today, marrying couples are on average five years older. Now, 14 out of 20 couples cohabit before marrying. Statistically, people who live together first are more likely to divorce than those who wait for the wedding before moving in. Marriage is now moving up the political agenda. If a marriage means that two people are more likely to stay together with their children, then that is a very positive reason for encouraging 
more marriages as a framework for bringing up children. That isolates and indeed alienates a whole bunch of people, a large number of people, a growing number of people who are in relationships um, but are not actually married in terms of having a piece of paper, having a certificate. Traditional marriage featured strongly at this month's Tory conference. More than 30 associations sent motions calling for more support. Many Conservatives argue that the breakdown of the traditional family is the root of wider social problems, such as crime and benefit dependency. So why are so many couples turning their backs on marriage? It has less to do with the attractiveness of marriage itself and more to do with a range of alternatives that people are allowed to choose. This applies more to women. Women have entered the labour market and they have moved up the skill grades into professional jobs through education. I always think that in my young day, if you weren't married, you were a spinster. And now if you're not yeah. married, you're a bachelor girl. Brought up to go to school, university, probably meet a man and get married. Well, you just don't have that today. And they have jobs that provide them with more money. Um, they get on the housing ladder quicker. Um, they can make choices that they didn't have to make maybe 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. I think at one point the reason you got married was because maybe you did want to leave home. You wanted to have a home. You couldn't and afford yeah. to support it yourself, yeah. so you got married. 20 years ago, only about a quarter of women with dependent children, for example, still had paid jobs. About 70% do now. This gives women choices and it makes unnecessary that dependence on single male wages which underpin marriage before 1960. Back to basics, basics, basics. And it's a nuclear family that they hack on about and I think it's also um, you know, ignoring what's really going on in this country which is, you know, people are in all kinds of relationships or not, you know, single parents heterosexual couples, gay couples, you know, all kinds of people can bring up kids and can, or can be a family without kids and, you know, it's like ignoring that and choosing, even Labour, you know, choosing not to face up to that. Lie strong families, families, families. Ali and Todd wanted to get married but didn't want a traditional church or registry service. They wanted to reinvent the wedding service to suit their 90s lifestyle. The reform of marriage laws earlier this year meant they could get married at a venue of their choosing. Manchester's fashionable Hacienda nightclub. It was amazing. Um, we had we had a stage set up, and um, we had the registrar sitting, the two registrars sitting at a big table on the stage, and we processed up to the stage from the lighting box on a balcony behind. Um, with a, some, a band playing Here Comes the Bride on the electric guitar, a bit reggae and a bit Jimi Hendrix style. And um, then we got to the table and had a solemn ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, we're gathered together today. We held hands on our procession up to the altar, um, sorry, registrar's table, so we sort of effectively gave each other away. We had an array of bridesmaids, we had a cupid, um, we had a best man who uh, wore a suit because he thought he'd be the odd man. Our mums were involved um, in the ceremony. To me it's the most romantic thing you could ever do. It's, it's, it's a sign of, of a commitment. It's, it, it's saying that you want to spend so much time, you, the rest of your life with somebody that you believe that they're, that they're your partner forever. And, it, and it's so nice, it's so romantic. I think the traditional setup um, is somebody else's traditional setup and it isn't ours. It isn't our generations and it isn't our faith um, and it's not our social life. I think the generation before us would have had a social life in the church um, around community centres and with that tradition. Um, and I think our generations have a social life in pubs, clubs, um, bars and cafes. Bars and cafes, yeah. <laughs> In 1995, it's not always easy to arrange a conventional wedding. Mark and Michelle wanted to get married in their local Anglican church. Because Michelle is a divorcee, their vicar wouldn't let them. Instead, 
they've had to design their own ceremony at Wakefield Town Hall. A blessing will follow later. The one thing that I want I wanted was to walk down the yeah, for her to walk down the aisle for me to, me to meet her. That was one of the most important things for me. So that's why I've got to walk down the stairs to meet her. Because we both have Christian beliefs, it was very important to us to have a church wedding. But many vicars stick by the Church of England ruling that divorcees can't marry in church if their former partner is still alive. Do take thee, John Mark Holmes. Do take thee, John Mark Holmes. To be my lawful wedded husband. To be my lawful wedded husband. I found it very difficult because, to me, Christianity is based on forgiveness. And after speaking to quite a number of ministers, um, I found I felt very guilty, as though I'd committed some awful sin, to be asking to be remarried. World in Action wanted to know if Britain's growing band of cohabitees have turned their back on marriage for good. We commissioned a representative poll from Gallup. Our survey said that people weren't in fact abandoning marriage, just postponing it. Four out of five cohabitees said they would marry eventually. Joe and Tom met four years ago at university. They now live together with their seven-month-old baby, Millie. Like most of the cohabitees in our survey, they say one day they might get married, but they're in no particular rush. I mean, ultimately, I would like to get married, but eventually, after maybe another ten years or so, but Millie is like my main focus at the moment. We just wait for that, that feeling to arise on me, really. Mm. Well, as soon as we found out um, about Millie, uh, it just kept being raised in conversations. People just assumed that we were going to get married as soon as Millie was born, if not before. And uh, they still do. <laughs> Let's get married. I love you. The proportion of children born out of wedlock has doubled over the past ten years. It's now more than one in three. At the same time, Britain's seeing the death of the shotgun wedding. In 1981, one in five pregnant women rushed to the altar before their baby was born. Now it's less than one in 20. Do you not feel there's, a, there's still a stigma attached to having children out of wedlock? We know people who have, um, well I know people that have refused to talk to me anymore because we've had a baby out of wedlock. I'm not mentioning any names. <laughs> some people, some very shocked people. It surprised me actually. It made me more against, I suppose, getting married because I didn't want a shotgun wedding or anything yeah. like that. <coughs> pressurised into it, pressurised the man into it. Did they sit then? Yep. Many, particularly the church, would like to encourage couples like Joe and Tom to raise their children within a traditional marriage. Some say the government should offer a clear financial incentive in the form of increased tax allowances for married couples. In money terms, um, the, over the last 30 years, um, married people have actually had to pay more and more taxation. If you take 1965, um, a married couple with two children with one bread earner in it paid about 9% um, of their uh, income in tax. Now, in 1995, that same couple will pay 23%. That's very tough on married people. In our survey, four out of ten cohabiting couples said financial incentives would encourage them to marry. The signs are that in next month's budget, the Chancellor will increase the married couple's allowance. Our concern in this current debate is that we just promote marriage and that the um, taxation authorities promote marriage as well because it is people publicly declaring that they have a legal commitment to one another and that is very important for the stability of society. I don't think it's right um, because what you're trying to what you're trying to do is to use um, taxation as a way of enforcing a certain uh, set of relationships within society and I don't think that uh, that's the role of government. But tax breaks can only encourage those with jobs to get married. At the other end of the scale, there's a strong incentive for lovers and even parents to stay apart. If a couple on state benefits set up home, they receive less money between them 
than if they lived separately. Four years ago, Paul and Debbie Skiro had a child together. Both of them were out of work and claiming benefit. Living apart, they realized they couldn't afford to get married, despite being committed to one another. We sat down with pieces of paper, left, right and centre, and tried to work figures out, and we just couldn't do it. It's just not feasible to do it. The money wasn't there, and the benefit side would just lose. would lose out tremendously. So we decided not to bother. While I was on my own with the two children, I was claiming income support for myself and the two girls. Um, there was also a child benefit, family premium as a lone parent, and a single parent's benefit. Paul and Debbie realised that if they got married, they would lose up to £100 a week in benefit between them. No matter how much they wanted to be together, they simply couldn't afford it. But the pressure from their families continued to grow. But then my side at family sat down with me, my mum especially, and said, well, think of children, Debbie. You know, you're not married, they'll carry your name. When you get married, then you've got to go through all regalia, uh, changing the names, and they need a stable home life. It was a lovely day, a bit like today. Sun was shining. To say I was nervous is an understatement. But it went really well. Um, I had a lot of surprises that I didn't think I'd have. And it, it was one of the best days of my life. Debbie and Paul are happy together as a family, but they say financial pressures make life hard for them all. I think we both agreed that if we could turn the clock back, if we'd have known then what we know now, we'd have left it, we wouldn't have got married. Um, it's an awful, I know it's an awful thing to say, but that's how we feel. Not because we don't love each other, we adore each other, but financially, I don't think we'd have done it. In fact, I know we wouldn't have done it. Love on the dole can be tough. <coughs> it's also tough on any couple when their relationship runs into difficulty. At least with married couples, there's a legal relationship which can protect the financially weaker partner. When cohabitees split up, there's no such guarantee. Valerie Byrne's separation from her partner became a landmark legal case. She moved in with her lover when she was 21. When they first met, he'd separated from his wife, but not divorced. I knew he couldn't marry me, so I had my name changed by Depot, so that I appeared to be Mrs. Because in those days, you're a scarlet woman if you didn't have that little piece of paper. And also, when the children were born, I wanted them to have on their birth certificate. Well, as far as I was concerned, it was a marriage, and I think he did, because he all talked about his wife. Everybody thought that I was his wife. Wherever we went, I was introduced as his wife. But after 18 years, the relationship broke down, and Valerie felt she had to leave the family home. I still loved him when I left him. But um, love sort of um, dies when people do and say horrible things. But, uh, you know, I had this image about marriage that it was forever. And I never had my bit of paper, but in my brain I had. So I was married forever. Now Valerie has built up her own business running a driving school. But it's been a struggle. After the breakup, she discovered cohabitees have no automatic legal rights even after years of home building. I literally redecorated from the top right the way down to the bottom, physically as well as monetarily. 